please raise your hand. Let's have these microphones running around. Okay, so who's uh, handling the mic? Are the microphones? Yes, okay, so there is a person, yeah. Hello, hi, Dr. Popkin, my name is David Cedic from, I work for FAO um, in the Cairo office. And so we, of course, in both in Egypt and all over the Middle East, they have this huge problem of obesity. And what would you say, um, what would be your recommendation for regulation of the foods? What should they start with? I mean, they've, they've done it in some, of the, in some of the countries of the region. But if you were to say right now, what should they start? Should they copy the, um, the approach in, um, in Latin America? Or what should, what should they do? Because I'll give you the background. This year, we're writing an um, overview of food security and nutrition it's, it's what this year I mean 2019 and we're just starting on it and so that's why I'm asking you this question what should they do okay well you're you're in a country number one Egypt where there's a subsidy of a lot of car breads and other things and you're in a very complex political situation that getting rid of those subsidies which created riots when they tried before so it's it's much more complex but you have a lot of sugar in the diet. There's a lot of other unhealthy components. I okay. don't know enough about your, about Egypt per se. I haven't worked there for a long time. But the reality is across the Middle East, sugar is a huge consumable. And, and sugar in everything. And it's not just, and it's adding sugar in the, the, the chai or the tea or whatever you want to call it. It's adding it in the coffees. It's, it's just, it's, it's certainly one of the key sources, but not the only one. It depends on the country. We did a national survey in the UAE, and there, gosh, if we really could affect the diet and get rid of the junk food and the sugary beverages, we would have had a big impact on, on, on the diets that they, have, that they consume. But it's also the activity problem. And there's a big gender imbalance in, in the Middle East. And it's a woman versus that are just staying at home with food all day and not moving much. And that is a very, very complex issue that I, I, I can see how we can deal with some of the food side, but I don't know how we can deal with that inactivity and that women staying home with the food all day. I do have a mic, so I take the opportunity. My name is Pia Schneider. I'm an economist with the World Bank. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, on the sugar uh, on the sugar tax. The UK has gone a different way. They have taxed the producer and not the consumer like in the other countries. And I think actually that's the only country that did this. And to my understanding, there has already been some change also with the producer changing the, the content of sugar. So I wanted to ask you your view on what would be you know, advisable. Should we tax the consumer or the producer? Uh, well, the UK is tacking the producer. What they did was they put in the three-tiered system where for different levels of sugar per 100 mLs of, of beverages, they had for different amounts of grams of sugar, they had a higher tax as you moved up. So companies reduced their sugar in a lot of cases. We don't have rigorous evaluations of that yet. We have rhetoric. but So we're going to find out. Uh, one of my group is we're on the evaluation advisory group for them, and we will. South Africa also did it a different way. They're taxing grams of sugar, hoping we'll, in a different way, we'll see that. A couple other countries we're working with were doing tiered taxes. But the reality is that we don't know what tax system is going to be the most effective. And we don't know what this reformulation is going to lead to. And we don't know what the substitutes in the UK will be, whether they'll be beer or whether they'll be uh, water or what they'll be. So the, each country has to be understood in terms of what substitutes there will be and also kind of what will happen on that reformulation in the cases when you're having the tiered and what are the long-term effects. And right now, we don't have any really major evidence that non-nutritive sweeteners are, are 
unhealthy. And that's what the UK is seeing a lot of. Huge increase in beverages with both sugar and non-nutritive sweeteners and the low calorie sweeteners. And we do not have the kind of, so we have no, right now, every major body says, we don't have the kind of data that says they're bad for you. They even change the taste of, in what you eat. But we're waiting on that. And that's what we're gonna need as well to really, truly understand. Um, Eugenio Diaz Bonilla from IFPRI, very nice presentation, Barry, as usual. Question, you mentioned quickly that the, the rate, the obesity in the poor income groups is growing faster than the middle and richer. But you also seem to say that the level is also higher. That has a relationship with whether we may need just a general policy or we need to separate by socioeconomic status. And the data that we presented in, the, in Costa Rica, when, where you were, was rather that we had a Kuznets curve. No? We had low obesity in the low income, increasing in the middle, and decreasing again in the higher income. So that may have changed, and now it's the poor that is more affected? Depends on, it depends on the country. What he's asking is how many countries in Latin America for a disproportionate number of the countries is more overweight now in the poor than in the rich. But in, in the rest of the world, it's not the case. It's just the rate of change is getting it there. That's not the case. So, so it, it, I, it, when I was thinking of Latin America when I mentioned that, but in a country like Mexico, it's much higher prevalence now among the, over, among the poor. And so you're finding that increasingly across Latin America as we get national surveys that give us the kind of data to look at that. But uh, it, the rate of change across South, across East Asia, and, and China it's also moved that way. But it's not that way in Indonesia yet, but it will be. And it's not, and it, it's increasing. It certainly is that the poor have more overweight in a lot of other regions in Central Asia. They do. So it just depends region by region. But the reality is that we still have Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, the biggest pockets of poverty and hunger and malnutrition. But we still, it's a more problem of the of the rich. But you will not find in any of these countries where there are less than 20% of the rural poor with overweight. So the fact is that we're still having overweight among the poor because the technological changes are affecting everybody. So it, w the absolute amounts are more important in my mind. And that's where the double burdens come in and all the other issues. Hi, Derek Hedda Ifri. Um, great talk, but obviously sort of slightly depressing in a way, although you ended on a sort of slightly positive note with um, Chile. So my question is sort of about the political economy and what you've learned from working with different countries, because it seems to me, just like with tobacco, there's going to be huge uh, private sector interests moving against this. And I'm surprised that uh, Chile is sort of the success story because the private sector is very powerful there, liberalized and so on. So firstly, if you could talk a little bit about um, what worked in Chile. Um, it seems to me ministries of finance maybe do have incentives for taxes, but not for some of these other policies. And then secondly, um, I've seen a lot of you know, studies casually in, in rich countries documenting the economic costs of obesity and NCDs. Um, do we have enough of these studies in low and middle income countries? Because certainly at the start of their transition, it seems to me there's very high benefits to prevention, but that doesn't seem well documented. It, there aren't that many studies like you're talking about. Ch but let me first mention Chile. So Chile had a unique situation. They had a, a minister of health who then became a president who was a pediatrician, and, and they had a congressional group led by a doctor by the majority, who has pulled together a coalition of co legislators that was very powerful, both in the House and the Senate, and with academics, with the Minister of Health, and then the President. They, they were able, over a period of time, to institute the laws I'm talking about. Then we get the conservative government right now. They wanted to stop 
But our results made them so they have continued. They actually allowed us to go to the second phase in the new government because they were so powerful. And the health costs of Chile were so great from the diabetes and the hypertension and everything. So that even this conservative government has allowed us to continue with the regulations. Whether we're, we had three phases of the sugar, salt, and saturated fat cut, cutoffs getting worse, tighter and tighter. And the third phase will be next summer. We have to show them some more results before they decide to go to the third phase. But if given the results we're having so far, they're going to be forced to do it just because it's so impactful. Uh, so that's the Chile case. Chile was unique. In, industry fights this everywhere. Industry's DNA in the food sector is no regulations. Whether they know it doesn't affect their sales. We haven't had an employment reduction in Mexico in their sector. They've just sold other products. It's not like we've, we've shown in any country yet employment changes and, and that they've lost the substitutions they're selling. They're selling bottled water in Mexico. They're selling other kind of substitutes in Chile. So the reality is industry still is fighting us. Uh, in the case of the warning labels, some pe we don't know how much people will be shifting to food instead of packaged processed food to real food. Uh, but we're talking about countries that are in really dominated by the retail food sector. So I suspect it won't be that great. And I suspect industry isn't going to lose that much, but they don't want it anyway. So the battles we're going through in Brazil, where they're trying to institute Chile right now, in Colombia, where they're trying to do it, in a couple other countries, they're huge. And it takes a government that's so constrained by economic costs of health, which is what all the Latin American countries have done. And they all have social security systems and national health systems. And it's the health costs that have done that. Now, have we documented in every country what you're talking about? Not everyone. We've got a few, and we're building that case. A number of years ago, I'd, we did a project with Lawrence Haddad, where we did some documentation on that in India and China as part of an IFPRI ADB project. So, uh, but we don't have documentation everywhere. And we need more of that. And that's just a matter of the amount of research and resources going into fighting NCDs is tiny at this point in history. Essentially, if you, you're all here from international agencies and you know about, other than Bloomberg Foundation and IDRC there's n and the Wellcome Trust, there's nobody in the world giving any money to fighting NCDs. Okay. Uh, we need to take a... You have to turn your mic on. Green light. Thank you. Uh, I had one or two questions related. One is, I mean, we've been hearing, and you also spoke a lot about the sugar beverages and proportionally, you know, versus because when even the lay public starts talking about sugar, then it's only sugar, and then you hear this dialogue saying fat is no longer important. It's only sugar that we need to. So how do, how do we bring about that balance in that dialogue? Because they both are important. Second is this whole, you know, how much work have you done and otherwise how important is it to focus on bringing back the millets, the healthy grains, and those kind of areas, especially in South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, where that will have an impact. Recently, I was in Guinea, West Africa, and I ate this grain fonio, which honestly I had never heard about. And it is supposed to be extremely nutritious, a traditional grain eaten there, but now going, you know, losing uh, it even amongst the local people. So that proportion. And the final thing is that, uh, when you mentioned that obese, you know, overweight is still less than 20 percent amongst the poor in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, but diabetes is increasing. So, you know, how do we balance that issue? Thank you. The sugar and fat issue is a very complex one. Today, we, we've changed our sense of the role of total fat versus saturated fat. And we're more concerned with saturated fat and sugar in terms of health and obesity and other things. And, but it brings up two issues. Sugary beverages may be 5 to 15% of the 
purchasing power, uh, bag of depending on the country. Uh, junk food is 25 to 30 percent depending on the country, that high. So if you want to get at fat and sugar and salt, you do both. And, and we should be doing both because it's the part of our diet that's the really highly processed, really unhealthy component. And the much bigger component goes into that food side. But because of the compensation issue, because of what I mentioned earlier about beverages, that we know that the quick, the, the, the low-hanging fruit is sugary beverages. It will also become soon, we're talking about juices as well. But in a couple of countries have got it in the tax law that we've worked with that if juice intake goes up, they're going to be taxed as well. So, but juices are generally more expensive in low and middle income countries, so they're not consumed so much unless they're homemade. Um, the millet issue, all of these sorghums, all these traditional grains, that's partly a green revolution issue. We, we made cheap wheat, rice, corn, and we didn't deal with all the other kinds of grains. Gosh, there's some really healthy millet bread in India that I had the other last week. I mean, there are lots of these things that you just don't see in the market much and you don't see out there. In the, and you're right. And some of these are much coarser. They're looked at now as, as low quality kind of negative products in many, many countries that I work in. And they're, they're being lost. And they can be terribly healthy and terribly important if we could figure out a way to have a millet and sorghum and other revolution, but that's not easy. Lastly, the diabetes. That's why I mentioned the obesity cutoff. We're being misled if we use just 25. And that is why we have to realize that that's just an indicator and it's so much a bigger problem. That double burden I talked about, if we were to talk about it in terms of we should have a cutoff of 22 or 23 for Asia, Latin America, Africa. Then we'd be really seeing a, a monster double burden. And that's what it really is in health terms. Yes, thanks. This has been very interesting. I just wanted to follow up on some of these points. My name is John McDermott from the International Food Policy Research Institute. Assuming that the poorest quartile in Asia are going to continue to eat processed foods, is there anything we can do with industry to help uh, make the healthy alternatives rather than unhealthy? Or do we just paint it as a tobacco issue rather than a more nuanced food issue? So I guess that's what can we do with them? Um, presumably they're going to be there. You say they can make money, whatever we make the rules to be. So, so what do we do? And, and Chile is the example. They are reformulating. Just like in the UK with beverages, in Chile they're doing it with everything. And they can get rid of a lot. And the real problem is we've also got to ultimately have not only a warning label for the unhealthy food, but a positive logo when it's whole grains and really healthy. But we first got to get rid of that top part in the ads before we can start pushing for the truly healthy diet. But you're right, they can do it. At least they say they can do it. We have to see if they can do it. But they, they say it and it's up, you know, but they won't do it. They won't get rid of the sodium in China. They won't get rid of the trans fats in other countries, in India. They won't get rid of the sugar when they can, even though they've done it in our country for a lot of these. So until we put the regulations in, the companies don't move. Even the same company that sells a low sodium product here that tastes identical to what they sell in India, they won't do it. So they need regulations. That's what we've learned and that's, kind of a sad, but it is a reality. Hi, thank you. My name is Chris Hagedorn, a private consultant with Food and Nutrition Security and recently uh, with the State Department. I have two questions. One is really focused on the U.S. and um, obviously we're moving in the last couple of years to a deregulatory approach. So a national regulatory uh, framework that you're suggesting here is probably unlikely. So my first question is, have you or are you working with key states, large uh, progressive states that are looking at the business case for this type of uh, public policy, looking at the cost of health care, of diabetes and the other NCDs that are, that are running health costs up? Can you make that, that business case? Because I think that's probably more effective in this climate. Second, different entirely, nutraceuticals are an approach that have been taken in some European countries, but it just doesn't go anywhere in the U.S. 
Is there a reason for that, and is that a different uh, uh, approach to this this question? Thank you very much. Um, when you talk about working with states, do you mean other countries or with the U.S. states? No, within the United States. Uh, with a few, yes. Uh, there are very few that are at that level. A couple of states have. We actually lost long ago when, got, when in New York a state tax, and clearly we've worked with a number of city departments in here in designing their taxes that we have. So we are involved, but and we're doing some, we'll be doing some national valuation looking across all the tax things and other stuff. So my, our group is involved in the US, but it's a lot easier for me to get something done in South Africa, despite what you could, the politics and the, than it is in the US and the climate we have today. So we're, but the Mexican example was essential in the valuation of Mexico to get the Berkeley tax and the San Francisco tax. So having these evaluations of what works in other countries will feed back on our country. Uh, the second point, nutraceuticals, I, I, I'm for real food and for, for packaged processed food that can be made whole grain and healthy, but I think these kind of pharmacological kind of add this nutrient or that nutrient is not going to be the answer to the obesity and the NCD problem personally. It's certainly making a lot of nutritionists and food scientists rich and food companies are trying to sell it everywhere. Uh, we actually for a while Coke in this country was putting vitamin C in Coke until they got shamed out of doing it. So the reality is it, it does exist in this country and it exists around the world and uh, in Chile, where we made the mistake of not putting a ban on claims on, on the unhealthy products, we saw them start to add different nutrients and make claims that they had these on them along with the warning labels. Luckily, the warning labels worked, but so we, we've learned and the laws we're designing in other countries were getting rid of the claims. Um, I have three questions from our online audience. The first one is from Purnima Menon from IFPRI South Asia office. She asked, very great talk. I'm viewing it from the hills in North India. Could you comment on India's food subsidy programs, cereals mostly, and their possible role in the increased overweight in India, uh, increased overweight India has seen in the last decade? And she also asked, when you come, when you go to India next time, see, you have to let her know so that she could host a seminar over there. Um, the second question is from Daniel at 1000 Days. Wait, wait, so yeah. th repeat the first part of the first question of Pernina's. Could you comment on India's food subsidy program and their possible role in the increased overweight in India? Yeah. This, the yeah. second question is from Daniel at 1000 Days. Um, he asked basically how to advocate for taxing sugary and unhealthy foods when many of these taxes don't have a lot of evidences in reducing consumption of unhealthy foods and promoting healthy food. This is especially challenging when policymakers are hesitant to increase taxes and industries are pushing back. And I have third question from Uma Lele. Great presentation, Barry. You had helped to change the conversation on food security fundamentally. How do you suggest dealing with resistance of the private industry and to make it behave in a socially responsible way? And I also have a fourth one. It's from Stuart. Um, he says, great talk, Barry. Any examples of social movements to drive change to complement top-down regulations? OK, well, on Pernina's, I don't know the research on the grain subsidies in India and the substitutions that and how that's affecting diet. It's typically on very low income populations. And uh, so I, I just can't comment on it. And tell her mafkije on the second part, uh, which means excuse me in, in India. And next year I will email her the next time I'm back there. Uh, on the, the second one, uh, on this issue of the taxes and, and what do we do to get these taxes, that's a very complex question. It's a big battle. There's no simple answer. Industry doesn't want to be taxed. They never have. And 
you have to make a case. In every country, we've been able to make health cases and economic cases, and you use both of them, and uh, you, you have to do that. Uh, in the U.S., in some cases, they've been more moral and otherwise, but it was able to do it in a few communities like that. But the money then in the U.S. has been used for public health good purposes. And we've tried to do that in some other countries, and we're successful in South Africa where the money, part of it will go for public health issues. We weren't so successful in Mexico. They promised getting us water, in potable water in all the schools. So it's really very complex. Uh, on Uma's comment, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to her more at dinner tonight, but the reality is I wish I knew how to, you know, I had the magic pill to get the industry to behave properly. And uh, the issue of top-down versus bottom-up is a really huge one. Clearly, we're trying the top-down approach, we, but it's not top-down. When we work in half the countries we're working without major advocacy campaigns, we would go no place. So we're providing the research support, but there are advocacy and media groups that go with. You're not going to, until you can get the public behind you. So we are kind of bottom up, top down at the same time. That so we're working on top down strategies, but we're, we have to convince the public and public opinion has to push the leaders in the country. And that's how we've succeeded in Mexico and in every country that we've gotten something like South Africa. Again, we convinced the public that they, diabetes was horrible and sugary beverages were a major cause and they wanted to get rid of it. So and the same happened in Mexico. So the reality is these are kind of top down, bottom up at the same time. You're not going to get these kind of regulations without changing public opinion. And it's, and it certainly takes sophisticated campaigns and it takes people like the Michael Bloombergs of the world or others to, to help countries create them and, and push them forward. But it's happening with bottom-up advocacy groups in the country that are concerned about the health of their populations doing this. So the, the answer is you need it all. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for that plug on the advocacy campaign. Um, I'm Lucy Sullivan with 1,000 Days. Um, the distinction around marketing uh, to children and marketing foods for children, if you could speak a little bit about that, one of the things that we are tracking is um, these new products called toddler formulas, which are massive growth um, uh, products for for industry that makes breast milk substitutes, massive growth in Asia. They're called like the Hello Kitty of, um, of of toddler foods. And in fact, the U.S. government is now apparently taking the position that these are not breast milk substitutes, but rather complementary foods. So this notion of you know drinks versus food and the biological distinction um, is an interesting one. Would just love your comment on that and and sort of the plea for research, more research and activity in this area. Thank yeah. you. Well, ever since we had the breastfeeding codes, we needed infant feeding research. And, the, and you're right. Among all the major formula companies, these post-six-month toddler foods, they have all sorts of different names depending on the company, are really huge growth market. And they're really pushing it. And as contrasted to traditional toddler foods that are fortified in some ways to make them healthy or to even uh, other kinds of toddler foods that you can get that are commercial or homemade, that it is a dangerous trend because they're expensive and if you get convinced low-income people to buy them, they're going to substitute by having less instead of more. And so it's, it's, it's a real problem and that's their market. It's a growth market and they're pushing it big time. And uh, I can't say any more, but we don't have much research on it. In the same way that we got Gates to add questions on junk food and sugary beverages, I don't know in the DHS surveys now, I don't know if they're asking about these kind of melts, but that ought to be one of the things you push them to do. 
Uh, we are working on that, just uh, to say <laughs> there is a, a group working on adding questions in the, in the uh, DHS that would capture these kinds of food. Schengen, you have the last question. And yeah. Well, thank you very, uh, the very exciting presentation. Now, you are one of the defectors from, from agriculture to nutrition. I just yeah. begin to cross the line. As you know, we have more than 2,000 agriculture economies in the International Association. I was in Vancouver, but very rarely they talk about nutrition. They still talk about GDP or employment to some extent, can we do something different? I mean, can we, it's a mobilize, a motivate, it's a, I don't know, maybe even 100,000 agricultural economies in the world to use nutrition as one of our objectives in our modeling, in our analysis. Omanini was online, I mean, she's, she's going to be the president. I really hope that she can take that message to that conference to make sure that nutrition is one of the objectives, maybe the objective. Now, you know, as you know, we are going to have a conference in Bangkok. Oma is going to be there. I really hope she will summarize some of the key messages that she can take into Bombay in 2021 during our next annual, um, sorry, not annual meeting, the, our uh, global gathering. So, Barry, any advice to us here? Yeah. Can so, first of all, Uma's right? already locked me into coming to the meeting in India, yeah, even though it's going to be in the summer and very hot, and she's very, very much trying to do this. Pear did this. We had a symposium in the International Ag Meeting in Adelaide a, a, a decade ago, and we tried getting more at that point, but it was, it's been very difficult. I think now, more ag economists are moving into this world in general, but it, it's still on the fringe. It, it's, it's still not, it's where the money goes. And it's up to our donors to start pushing that. And I, I, I'm hoping it'll happen. But uh, clearly UMA has planned already for several symposia around this topic and plenaries and other things. Thank you. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming. Yes, thank you everyone for wonderful.